You are listening to Latinx America, a podcast focused on highlighting catalysts who are using, leveraging, or creating technology to help our community achieve more. With your host, Adriana Flores Agade. Ish, thank you so much for joining us at Latinx America. We've been uh, having this conversation about having you on the podcast for a while, so I'm excited to have you here. And I know a little bit about your story, and I know that a lot of the people that listen will be very interested. So can we start by learning a little bit about, about your family history and how you went from growing up in Southern California in East LA to now uh, working for one of the premier networking companies? Yeah, of course. So, hey, everybody. My name is Ish. Uh, that's short for Ismael Verduzco El Tercero. Uh, I guess growing up, my dad and even me, we uh, kind of kind of got this nickname and it's it stuck. So, my name is Ish. Um, so, I was born in East LA and I was raised all throughout Southern California, um, everywhere from East LA to West LA, Southgate, Pomona, Riverside, Fontana, Rancho. And my parents live in Ontario now. Um, I think one of the main reasons why we moved so much growing up is because my parents always just wanted a better life for us. They wanted us to attend better schools, be around b better neighborhoods, um, and just have more access to opportunity. So I guess during the moment when we were always constantly moving, it was frustrating and it was always tough being the new kid on the block. But now looking back, I'm like super grateful and there's so much that I've learned from always being the new kid and being able to adapt to situations. So yeah, I moved, moved to town. I went to high school out in uh, Fontana, Rancho area. So I don't want to high school. Attended UC Merced. And I when I first attended, I studied um, mechanical engineering, which is not my, up my alley at all. I'm more of like a business marketing type of guy. The main reason why I wanted to study mechanical engineering is because I remember my senior year, I just Googled highest paying jobs out of college. And I think that was like number two after doctor. And anybody that knows me knows that I can't do blood and I'm not good in a doctor's office. So that's the one that I chose. But after a semester of going to school there and taking all the classes, I really realized that that wasn't for me. So I quickly shift, shifted over to management, which is the closest thing that I can get to business and marketing at UC Merced. So while I was at, the, while I was at UC Merced, super involved, I did decently well in my classes. I think I graduated with like a 3.0. But more than anything, I was like involved with all the events, clubs and organizations, Latino organizations, student life, student government and all that. After I graduated in 2014, I moved back home with my parents in Ontario because I couldn't find a job. I was applying like crazy. I probably applied to like 200 jobs from my senior year winter break in December all the way up till graduation and didn't get one of them. So there was probably a flaw in like how I was applying. I could have done a better job doing that but needless to say I didn't I didn't end up landing one that I that I wanted so I moved back to with my parents for a few months started working at 24-hour fitness I got that job through a job fair as an assistant at the time it was an assistant service manager which is basically helping to manage the team that does like service at the front desk and facilities and the zoom instructors and all that so that was a fun job because I like working out but uh, I quickly realized that that wasn't for me either just because I liked working out so much that I was always itching to want to be in the gym working out, not working in the gym. And then ever since I think my junior year, I'd, I had always wanted to work in tech. So like at a Twitter, Twitter was like my number one, uh, Twitter, Google, Facebook, or LinkedIn. So around the time that I was at 24-Hour Fitness, I was on LinkedIn every single night because I didn't really like my job that much. And then I noticed that one of my friends, Kevin Ali Busan, was working at LinkedIn as a contractor doing recruiting coordination. And then, like, feel free to stop me if, if there's anything you want me to, like, elaborate more on. But I reached out to him on LinkedIn. I bugged him a ton. I texted him. I called him. And I said, hey, Kevin, I think there's this role that I would be perfectly fit for. It was an event it was a, an event coordinator role, contract role as well. So I bugged him. I texted him. I called him. I hit him up everywhere I could on, on social media. He was fairly new into the role, so he was trying to get me in while he was still establishing himself. And finally, I was able to get him on the phone. And I basically just told him, hey, man, like, this is the role for me. I can do this job better than anybody else. Like, if you put me on the phone with the hiring manager right now, like, I will sell her or him, whoever it is, I'll sell myself to the role. And he thought I was crazy, but he happened to be in, like, the little cafe area at uh, the office that he was in. And uh, he, he had mentioned my name to the hiring manager, which is, was his boss at the time as well. A couple mm -hmm. of times and uh and they they were happened to be like in passing and she like mentioned something to him like oh who, who you're on the phone with is that is that ish the guy you've been telling me about 
And then he like got a little nervous or got like, he, he, like kind of fumbled a little bit. It was like, yeah, it's actually him. Like we're actually talking about the role. And she's like, pass me the phone. Like I'll, I'll talk to him right now. And uh, ended up speaking to her like on the spot after like hitting him up a bunch of times. And I basically told her, I was like, hey, I know you've seen my experience. I know that you know that I can do the role. I was like, all I'm asking is for like a shot to interview. That's all I'm asking. I was like, if I, I can go up there and interview today, tomorrow, like whenever. And I was in Southern California at the time. And she's like, okay, like, like I'll give you a shot. Like when, when can you come in? Like when can you come in and interview? I know you're in LA or in Southern California. Um, and I said, well, today is uh, Tuesday, so I can get up there tomorrow so that I can get back down to Southern California by Friday to give my parents the cars because they needed to use it or mm -hmm. I didn't have a car at the time. So uh, she, she thought I was crazy. She was like, no, like, there's no way I'm going to make you drive eight hours over like during the day just so you can come interview tomorrow. She's like, I'll give you till Thursday. It was a Tuesday at the time. She, so I drove up Wednesday, like the entire day, drove up, got to San Francisco stayed with my friend Eugene, kind of just prepared for the interview, like got my resume, my cover letter, my suit pressed and everything, and then interviewed that Thursday. Crazy thing is, when I got there for the interview, she told me that the job that she had asked me to come interview for had just been filled by somebody else. She found somebody with like graduate experience in, in events. It was an events role. And I was like 21 years old, fresh out of like college and still didn't have that much real life work, work experience so I was kind of devastated but at the end of the day I wanted to work at LinkedIn so I would figure out a way to get in and then find a role that would best fit my background so I asked her well like should I just drive back like what do, what do I do now and she said well we have another recruiting coordinator role open if you want to interview for that and then down the line see what happens so to kind of put it into perspective there are two different roles recruiting coordinator and event coordinator Recruiting coordinator does more of like logistics and planning and working with recruiters and interviewers and interviewees um, mm -hmm. to help that plot that process be as seamless as possible and provide the best candidate experience. The event coordinator role was more of planning and logistics and doing things that I had already done for the past like four or five years that I was used to doing. Um, so there were completely different roles and I'm not very good when it comes to super micro logistics but I'm mm -hmm. good at like planning things out, if that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. So when it came to the interview, she sat me down and she's like, okay, well, since you're interviewing for your recruiting coordinator role, here's your first like test, I guess. And she handed me, uh, it was like a matrix of like, I think it was like nine interviewers and there was like four of them female, five of them male. And then there was like nine candidates and there was like, I don't know, like eight or nine different time slots on three different dates or something crazy. And she was like, okay, well, I don't forgot what the question was, but it was something like, okay, every interviewer needs to interview a candidate, but they can't interview them twice. And any, every candidate needs to interview with a uh, male and female. And I was like, oh shit. Like I like got like dumbfounded immediately. I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. As she's sitting in front of me, like, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. So I tried my best. I knew I didn't do well. I, I knew I didn't even finish it um, in the time that she gave me, but I turned it in, I interviewed, and throughout the entire interview process with everybody that I interviewed, I kind of like hinted at the events experience that I had, because that's all that I could lean on. And then uh, go ahead and interviewed, finished that Thursday, got a call that Friday from her, and she basically told me like, hey, I just wanted to let you know, you bombed the interview, you, did, you didn't do so, too hot, um, so we're not able to offer you that role, but you showed so much uh, excitement and like past experience in your events and your passion for events that we're going to open up a contract role for you to do events here at LinkedIn. And that's kind of like a long winded answer of how I got to like LA to LinkedIn. Um, and then from LinkedIn to here, it's kind of like progressed. I got converted full time. I started taking side projects on doing social media marketing, jumped into a, like a project management role where I was doing social media events, talent brand, employer brand, and then, that all helped me get to like the, the role that I'm in now, which is social media marketing full time at LinkedIn. So tell us a little bit about what that means. So if someone were to step on your role, what would it be like? And also what skill set did you have to develop? Because you were interested, you mentioned since your time at you know 24 hour fitness in working for 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 like a Twitter or a LinkedIn or a Facebook. Mm -hmm. What kind of skill sets do you have to develop and how are you applying those skills right now in your current role? 
Yeah. I mean, one of the skills that I kind of, I kind of had, but not formally was just knowing the platforms. So I've always been like super interested in social media ever since like I was like 12 or 13 years old, back from like the MySpace and the AOL and Sim Messenger days. So I guess number one is just having an interest in social media and the power of what it can do in terms of like sharing information. I think understanding how each platform works and how they're different and how they can reach different audiences. That's like step one. Step two for me was to get really good at writing because a lot of social media marketing is like writing copy and being able to share that with hundreds of thousands of followers, depending on how big your audience is. So Mm -hmm. what I did is I took a bunch of LinkedIn learning courses at the time. It was uh, lynda.com. I took a bunch of lynda.com courses. I read a couple of books, talked to people that were really good at writing or that I thought were good at writing. And they kind of helped me little by little, uh, little hacks like Grammarly, which is an app that you can download and add to your Google Chrome, help you like fix your grammar over time, which helped me a ton too. But yeah, those, those are kind of like the two big things. And then I guess just applying the learnings that I had to real life experience. So the way that I did that was with my own social media and building out my social channels and any little strategy that I would learn about online, I would go ahead and test it out for a week or two weeks and see if it works and see what measure the growth and then try to foresee, well, if I did this for the next six weeks, how much could I grow? And then keep track of that over time. So that when I did interview or now that I'm in the position now, I can like think about these little growth hacks and test them out on a like larger scale. So you were experimenting with your own profile and your own content before yeah. you before you yeah. started with experimenting with LinkedIn. Um, what role, and, and we mentioned Linda a few times, Linda, and then ne- Linda was acquired by LinkedIn. So it's now LinkedIn Learning. Mm-hmm. And they have a lot of, you know, a lot of wonderful courses. We were talking earlier that I'm taking a few courses. But what role do you think formal education still plays on the type of role that you have, especially since everything is really at your fingertips, right? Yeah, I thought about this question a little bit. And looking back at my personal experience, I think formal education, like going to a UC and doing four years there, I didn't learn too much about what I'm doing now in like at, the, at UC Merced. If anything, going to UC Merced gave me the network of people and taught me how to like learn more or like formally learn and how to dissect a course or how to dissect a book and be able to take like, the key takeaways. But in my roles for social media marketing, I guess it's, it's, since it's so new and since a lot of marketing is online and you can learn about it. I don't think it's too necessary. I think it's kind of screwed when in the system we, we're in now because a lot of companies will require like, I mean, it's less, it's more of a trend now that they're going away from this, but they'll require like four year degree in management or marketing when you can find somebody or somebody can go ahead and learn these skills and, and develop them a lot more than somebody who went to school for it and studied it because they actually have like real life experience, like applying the marketing tactics with a business or with a group or organization. So I think if somebody were listening to this and they wanted to go into social media marketing, what tips would, would I like provide them aside from like going to school? Because that's not what I did to do what I'm doing now is take classes online, stay like brushed up with all of the social media marketing tactics, follow people that are in the social media world, like the Gary V's, my friend Carlos Gill is great at content and then implement all of those learnings as much as you can to kind of like measure what works and what doesn't work. So let's go back to non-traditional resources. You mentioned that someone can learn what you're doing just, you know, by taking courses that are not necessarily taught at a university level besides LinkedIn learning and besides following people that are creating amazing content. What would be other sources that people can go to learn? That's a good question. I mean, there's audiobooks, there's podcasts, like there's social media marketing world, which is a huge conference for social media marketers. So I guess there's in-person events as well, podcasts. We talked about following people, talked about taking classes online. There's blogs, there's YouTube videos. I guess finding, figuring out like what best form of learning the, every person, like the individual person is most inclined to absorb the information and then figuring out like, for me, that's audio. Like I like listening to audiobooks. So then I like double down on that and find all the audiobooks that I need or podcasts that I need. So yeah, I think just figuring out what means of media that is. 
Thank you. What would you say is the future of social media, just given that this is your world? And especially as we see, I think almost every week, there's something about a privacy issue with with social media platforms. And also besides LinkedIn, which one is your favorite social media platform and, and why? Of course, you have to say it. <laughs> um, okay. So I think the future of social media space is going to be more of like one-to-one interaction versus one too many, especially with like, there's so much noise right now on social, like you go on Instagram right now and there's tons of content, you go on Twitter, tons of content. You don't really know what's real, what's fake. You don't know what's going to add value to you. And it's kind of like overwhelming at times. So I think that companies, brands, people are going to be more of a, yeah, like a one-to-one interaction. So one thing that I've been thinking through in my role is how can like LinkedIn as a brand or LinkedIn talent solutions, which is the business line that I support, like dip into communities where there's already people in their own private groups interacting and just add value to those groups instead of like sharing out information to everybody, being a part of the community and building that with them. Um, To answer your second question, I think, I mean, my top three favorite are LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Those are the three platforms that I think are the most valuable. I think out of all the three, LinkedIn is the most impactful only because the way the platform works compared to the others. So if you think about Instagram, unless you're sponsoring content, whatever you put out there on Instagram, the only people that are going to see it for the most part are the people that are following you versus LinkedIn. If you and I are connected and I put out a piece of content and you love it and you like it and comment, then people in your network are going to see Adriana commented on Ish's post. Then I hit a, like a second degree of like people, which then allows me to have more impact. Twitter has that effect to some degree too, but I think that LinkedIn is probably the platform to be on right now if you're like trying to share information to a broader audience that's not within your first degree. Well, and it's the different kind of interactions and you know Instagram videos or Instagram stories. You, mm. you, it's kind of a different look and feel, right? Yeah. Whereas with your with LinkedIn, you have a completely, I guess, different voice, even though you have similar messaging. Mm-hmm. Um, and with with Twitter, you're kind of limited on like what you can share and yeah. how you share it as well. You mentioned your friend Carlos. Can you repeat his name again yeah. and what his handle is so people listening could potentially follow him and are there other influencers that you are following and why yeah so his name is carlos gill at carlos gill on all his like uh, channels great guy he actually worked here at linkedin for a little while he's done social media marketing for like 10 years so he knows his stuff when it comes to social media so he's like somebody that i look up to too i follow a ton of his content he does a lot of speaking engagements so yeah check his content out in terms of other influencers i don't think there are too many i think lately i've been learning more about marketing in general by following other people's stories people's and brand stories so for example there's a podcast that i've been listening to a ton it's called short story long by this guy named drama who has his own company called young and reckless and he interviews just like this but one-to-one people that have huge brands and companies and business and clothing lines and djs and people that other podcasters don't normally interview and get the full scoop on. So I think through those interviews, I've learned a ton about how they built their brand and how they used media and marketing and branding to build their empires and the impact that it had. So I wouldn't say that there's one particular or two particular like influencers that I follow, but more so just like following these stories and trying to find trends over time that I can then implement with my work. So speaking of influencers and people having an influence and what you're doing and how you, how your success manifests itself, who has influenced you the most personally and or professionally and why? It sounds like a super cliche answer, but my parents and my grandparents, the main reason why is my grandparents were born in Mexico. They came over here so that their kids can have a better life and that they can find, I guess, more success and live better. My parents were both born in L.A., so I'm second generation Mexican-American. And I think the reason why I answer this question with parents and grandparents is just understanding and learning about the sacrifices that they gave up or that they, they went through so that I could have a better life, my sisters can have a better life, made me have a, a deeper appreciation of everything that I've 
that I put myself towards. And I don't think if I had that appreciation that I'd be nearly as like hardworking or as grounded or as willing to learn than if I, if I hadn't learned about everything that they've gone through. Um, what about professionally? Professionally? I think there are, in each stage of my life, there have been different people. Like in high school, I had the one teacher that would always like look out for me, even though I wasn't good at the subject. In college, I had a couple of different bosses that knew that I could achieve more. So they pushed me and they taught me. And like post-college, I think one person that you actually interviewed is Hector, Hector Preciado. He was actually like the first Latino that I've seen here, that I've met here at LinkedIn. Um, I think on my second or third day, I had gone two or three days without seeing person of color. But I saw him in the the hallway and he's like, hey, I haven't seen you before. I was like, hey, what's up? And we just hit it off after that. He ended up being like a really close friend, a uh, mentor of mine. And over time, provided me with like opportun- like leadership opportunities to step up and plan events and be a part of OLA, which is organization here at LinkedIn for Latinos and allies. And he had a huge impact on me because he actually made me feel a lot more confident in my skin being here in tech, which we know is, is not as diverse as it, as we like it to be. So, yeah. Um, I love Hector and I love Hector's stories. I have to say that um, just to be very transparent, my husband does work at LinkedIn and I don't just interview people from LinkedIn because, um, <laughs> because I love the company. I do. I mean, I use the platform. My husband laughs at me. He's like, wow, you're paying for premium. I've been paying for premium for like so many years because I find it to be just such a valuable platform separate from the fact that, that he's there. So just, just for the audience transparency, I find really interesting people and many of them, or some of them, have happened to be at, at LinkedIn. So let's talk a little bit about the best advice that you've ever received in your professional life. What was it? And also, maybe what was the worst advice that you wish someone had, you know, not given you? Yeah. So the the best advice that I ever received was actually something that I've gotten as a kid, and I think a lot of other people of color, Latinos, have gotten this advice too. Um, it's from my grandma. She always, ever since I was little, ever like would ingrain in my mind, like "Echale ganas y estudie mucho." Like, work hard and study hard, no matter what you do. Just as long as you like give it your all and everything that you put your hand into, and you continuously study. Because she only went to like second grade or third grade. She was able to make it too. And I think growing up, it was super. It was very literal what she was telling me. Like, work hard in school and study in school. But I think what she taught me more than anything else was a mindset of like continuously craving like learning and that has applied in every aspect of my life not just school not just work like any project that i put myself into sports that i've like been a part of and projects that i've been a part of being able to put myself in a mindset where if i don't know the answer i can learn the answer versus like hiding or retreating and and being self-conscious so I think that's probably the best advice that I've ever received because I can apply it in every every situation that I put myself in. I think the worst advice that I, they didn't give it to me, but I heard it once, was good things, and it's kind of controversial, it's good things happen to people that wait. And I think depending on how you, how the person receives it or how you, because uh, it can go one of two ways. It's, it's what they're trying to teach is patience, right? Mm-hmm. Which I think is very important, but... There, there's also a sense that if you're, if you don't have the context of what they're trying to say, then the person can interpret it as, okay, I'm just going to sit back and wait until something happens to me. Versus, I think a different approach to that, which I would have context to, is good things happen to people that wait while you're working hard or working towards whatever you're trying to achieve. So adding that second layer on it provides context in terms of you have a goal. If you're doing X, Y, and Z to achieve the goal, be patient over time, but still work towards that goal, if that makes sense. No, that but makes I've, absolute sense. Yeah, but I've seen, I've seen, or I've even have like friends and family members that are like, well, I'll just be patient, sit back, something eventually will happen or land in my lap. Like that's not really how the world works. You kind of have to go out and, and look and fight a little bit and do the work yourself in order for something to fall in your lap because it's not just going to be a coincidence. I think that has a lot to do with our culture, nuestra mm-hmm. cultura, and with us what it's been ingrained for generations. We're like, 
si eres paciente, calladita, te ves más bonita, you know, that, that whole thing of like, just sit back, wait, you know, th good things will come your way. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the American culture, you know, once you become acculturated, it's the opposite way is you have to have the drive, you have to have the, the growth, you know, the continuous growth, you have to kind of achieve more and take it to the next level. So it, so I like how you rephrased it because things are not going to happen to our community. We've been sitting back for, for a long time and, and I'm going to speak specifically about tech. We've been kind of, okay, things will happen. Well, we've seen a generation of people in East LA, in East LA or East Palo Alto and, you know, San Jose here, uh, Sunnyvale that nothing has happened in terms mm. of making the inroads that we should be making in, in the tech world. So I, I'm hoping that by hearing what you have to say and that caveat, that spin that you put on the echale ganas and also the, you know, things will happen that our community will kind of listen and say, Hey, you know, I, I need to kind of be in charge of my own destiny in, in some way. Right. Exactly. Couldn't agree okay. more. Well, What other advice do you have to share before we talk about your next play? So I think given that I'm in social media marketing, the best advice that I could provide is to use your personal like channels to try to build, I wouldn't say build your brand or I would say more so just connect with your audience as much as possible. Um, I think social media can get a bad rap depending on who you talk to. Because, it, I mean, in the news and a lot of times nowadays, people are just spending hours and hours mindlessly scrolling on Instagram, scrolling on Twitter, scrolling on like Facebook, even LinkedIn, without having an intent to learn or without having an intent to grow. It's more so just like an escape. But I think if you flip that on its head and you think of it more of as, as a tool and think of it as, well, okay, well, if I have these four channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, how can I use them to connect with people that I meet at events? How can I use them to share content so that I remain top of mind or so that I ke actually keep in touch with them over time and set reminders so that I can check in with Adriana, see how she's doing. And doing that over time will then make sure that you're like top of mind, I guess, if that makes sense. So one, one thing that I've done ever since high school, uh, when I like built out like back in MySpace and Facebook and Twitter and eventually when Instagram came out, Uh, was I thought of how can I use these channels to connect with everybody that I've met in real life online? Whether that's somebody that I've met in a different country, a different city, the odds of me seeing them again in person are slim to none, if, especially if it's a different part of the world. But how can I still make them feel connected to me and me connected to them? Because it's super easy. It takes one quick message. It takes one quick post of 10 second posts of me posting a video saying how my day is going, what I've learned people that I've interacted with, what I've learned here in my role, even like this podcast, sharing that out with my network and providing value to other people and chopping it up and sharing the top three to five tips so that they don't have to then listen to all of it. If they just get these two main takeaways, then they've learned something and I added value to their day. So I would say just think about how you're using social media, really assess how you're using it. Like look at that. I think if you have an iPhone, you can check to see how much time you're spending on each app every day. And, and really, like, think about it. Do you want to be spending an hour, two, two hours, three hours on Instagram? Where could you be reinvesting that time learning or speaking to a family member or taking a class or listening to a book? So, yeah, just reassess how you're using social media and then, I guess, have a drive and eagerness to learn. Thank you. Yeah. One last question. What's your next play? What's in the horizon? I know that you transitioned recently into a new role at LinkedIn. So you started mm -hmm. as a contractor and you eventually moved and you, you've been in different roles at LinkedIn and you've yeah. grown as a professional. So what's your next play in terms of learning or anything you'd like to share? Yeah, I think uh, I've been in social media marketing for formerly probably two years now. I was doing this part of my job before that, but now it's been like full-time my job for a year and a half, two years. I think what I want to go into next is more brand marketing. And social media is is a leg of brand marketing. It's if you think about the way you interact with brands online and your favorite brands in the world, the Nikes, the Netflix, all the awesome brands, Coca Cola, and how they interact with their audiences. That's social media marketing. But at the end of the day, that that gives you an impression of what the brand is like, because that's the front facing um, form of media. 
what I want to do, like after what I'm doing now is develop what the personality of what that brand is, what that looks like, and build out a plan for how that brand reaches the target audience that they that they want to to reach. So I don't, I'm like, I'm still at LinkedIn. I love my job, but I think I want to get really good at what I'm doing now. And then eventually probably do that at a smaller company or at a bigger company if I have the opportunity to, as long as I'm able to have a hand in building what that, the characteristics are, um, whether that's like the voice of tone, the humor, the audience, the target audience, what the content's going to look like, how they're going to be reached, all that. That makes sense. And, uh, you can also do a side gig as well, you know, while you're at LinkedIn. <laughs> Speaking of side gigs, I want to know, are you still DJing before? I am. You yeah, I had two gigs this weekend. So, yeah. Uh, so we tell, us, <laughs> t- tell us about that side of you, which is really fun. Yeah, I should have mentioned that earlier. So uh, I guess a part of why I have used so much social media is because I built myself as a brand, as a DJ. Um, I've been DJing for nine years now. The genre of music that I do is, I guess it's more of open format, but it's mainly like Latin music, so reggaeton, house music, and hip hop. Lately, I've been playing more Afrobeats because my roommate plays like, like likes a lot of Afrobeats. So yeah, I've been DJing for nine years. Started off just doing like in my room, then do like little parties with the speaker and my laptop, then like bought more and more equipment, and then eventually got into like bars and clubs, did a ton of parties, a couple of family parties. And then when I moved out to San Francisco is when things started to really pick up because I had the opportunity to just plug myself into these different networks of people and then show the skill that I have and show the value that I can bring to the table. And yeah, I've DJed in New York, Las Vegas, San Francisco, LA, Seattle. I think I'm missing a few, but yeah, I plan on picking it back up a little bit more. It's a, it's a tough balance finding be, or being able to to dip between like DJing, it's like its whole other world, and then tech, and then within tech, marketing, and then within tech, social media. So managing the following for work now, we have a million followers. So that that's a strenuous job on its own, being a team of one. And then after work, being able to like switch that off and then go back into like, okay, well, what do I need to do? What, what gigs do I have coming up? How do I prepare? Do I need to post anything? Do I need to share anything? Do I have to download anything? How do I prep? But it's fun. It keeps me it keeps me occupied and I like doing it. So I wouldn't have it any other way. All right. And then you're mixing in the Latin feel and oh, yeah. every, every everything that you're doing. So how do people find you? Both for uh, the DJing, but also for, you know, <laughs> where can they find where can they find you on social media? Yeah. So it's DJ ish, DJ I S H H, uh two H's on all social media. So Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram. I have a LinkedIn for it too. But my personal LinkedIn where I I share a ton of good content. It's just Ish Verduzco, I-S-H, and then Verduzco, V-E-R-D-U-Z-C-O. And I share content on a daily basis, six times a week, seven times a week, multiple times a day. And what I try to do when I share content to my network is cut all the crap out and only share like the top 10% that's going to add value. So sometimes that means me reading 10 articles and sharing one, or me reading 15 articles and sharing the top three or dissecting the top three and then sharing just the key learning so that when you see it on your feed, you're like, wow, this is awesome. I like this. I learned something I want to reshare with my network. And then over time, I'm like building myself as a brand, as a content creator and somebody that can share good content. Great. Well, you can find, you know where to find Ish now. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your story. And I'm sure we'll be in touch. And I have to tell you that I feel like your brand marketing and everything that you're doing is working because when we started the conversation, we we started with, before we actually, before we started recording, we started talking about like catching up. And I'm like, I feel like, I feel like I know everything that's <laughs> happening to with you and to you because because of how active you are with with um, your social media platform. So yeah. thank you for sharing your wisdom and your personal story and professional journey. And um, we look forward to continuing to see you grow. Thank you. And if anybody's listening, uh, wants to reach out or has any questions, I'm like more than happy to answer or share like any learnings that I have, books that I've read, podcasts that I listen to and all that. So feel free to reach out. And if anyone's listening and wants a job at LinkedIn, you know how he got his. So please hit him up. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Latinx America and on Twitter at America Latinx or email any questions or ideas to latinxamerica at gmail.com. Gracias y hasta la próxima semana.